So I want to talk about three P's, power, physiology, and perception. I want to put them together uh, a bit. But I want to start with this question. A lot of you are coaches, a lot of are athletes, so I'm going to ask you a quick question. How many times have you or your athletes, athlete, trained this year? Think about it. Put a number to it in your head. For me, uh, that number is probably about 250 right now. But for uh, an elite performer, it's probably at least 500. 500 individual training sessions that you have prescribed and your athletes have executed. Now I'm going to do a little math and say, think about that, 500 times in a season, it may be closer to 600 for a high-performance rower, let's, let's do this. Now you may say, well, nobody told me we were going to do exponents today. But this is the amount of average improvement per session that you would need to achieve, that's 0.01 percent. If you had 500 sessions and every session led to the same amount of improvement, at the end of the year, you'd be 5% better. Now, you say 5%. Well, 5% in high performance, you guys know, you'd be pretty damn happy with that, wouldn't you? If you had a 5% improvement for an athlete that's been in the game for five, six years. My point is that, good grief, 500 sessions to achieve a 5% improvement, which is probably bigger than you're going to achieve, the effect of each session is minute and we have to understand the big picture when we're training athletes we often get caught up in the single workout but it is the it is the impact the total impact of hundreds of sessions that are that is ultimately determining your success or failure and there's been a lot of discussion about the term complexity and complicated. What's the difference between something that's complicated and something that's complex? In English, sometimes they say those are the same, but they're not. A complicated situation, like I, I was involved in designing a building that got built. Boy, building that building was extremely complicated. There were so many different steps that had to be done in the right order, but with enough expertise and enough spreadsheets, we did it. The building was built perfectly on time. Complicated but solvable problem. Complex problems are different because there's so many variables that you can't build a spreadsheet that will predict everything that can happen. That's coaching. That's the reality of coaching athletes is it's complex. It's not complicated. And that means you, you can't control complexity, but you can manage it. Right? Things are going to happen. Sickness happens. Unexpected stresses occur. And so this is the serenity prayer for coaches, I would say, when you're working with high-performance athletes, is we want to be able to measure things and predict things and monitor things, and we should be able to accept that there will be some aspects of training load of the effect on your athlete you're not going to be able to measure. You're not going to be able to calculate it. And you're going to need to accept that and then be thankful for what you can measure. Now, so this is the negative start of this, is training athletes is complicated, it's complex, it's hard, and we can't predict everything. But here's some things we know. We can apply an external load. You guys often use stroke rate, but you can use power. And the load is not just power, but power times some period of time, right? So we're always talking about an, an intensity times a duration. But it's not the external load that ultimately is going to determine the success of the program. It's how your athlete responds to it. And so we have to understand what the in internal load is that the athlete is experiencing, both physiologically, perceptually. That internal load, a lot of good things are going to happen. We're going to turn on molecular signals for adaptation, mitochondrial protein synthesis, and so forth. But there is also a downside. And you are inducing stress on your athlete. And both of these are going to have knock-on effects, they're going to have feedback effects on that relationship between the external and the internal load. So you can't separate these. If you just look at power or stroke rate during training, you're missing what really, in a sense, matters from a training standpoint, because you are in charge of trying to induce some molecular biology, whether you like it or not, 
that's what you're doing as a coach. You're trying to turn on signals and avoid too much stress and balance this over 500 training sessions per year, plus, maybe. So at least a lot of my research has been about this, is that what can I do, what can we learn that can help us just make some positive impact on this balance between getting maximum adaptive stimuli at a sustainable degree of stress, a tolerable degree of stress, because we don't want to push our athletes over the edge. There are a lot of negative sides that we have to look at. There, you know, muscle damage, bone, tendon damage, depends a little bit on the sport. Not so much bone and tendon damage in rowing, but some muscle damage, inflammatory stress, repeated sympathetic stress can lead to overtraining. There's immunosuppression. There's obviously psychological fatigue. So you are managing these against those biochemical signals that you're trying to induce to help them uh, build more mitochondria, bigger heart, and so forth, and produce higher power. So a lot of my work, if you've read any of it, it's been about this. It's been that what we've seen in across sports, including rowing, is that high-performance athletes tend to, uh, to do a lot of their training below that first lactate threshold. They accumulate a lot of volume at low intensity, low being relative speaking, and then they do some training at higher intensities, but they don't train too much in the middle threshold. Like if we take this example, this is some research we did where we looked at all Norwegian uh, international medal winners from the 70s, 80s, and 90s at the time, and then looked at, we had some physiological data, their height and weight, but something happened that on average, these athletes had bigger capacity than these, and then it kind of maintained. So from the 70s to the 80s, something happened that was consistent with performance changes internationally. Well, this is what changed training-wise. That at, from the 70s to the 80s, what we started to see was more focus on basic endurance training, meaning low intensity volume, and actually a reduction in high intensity. This was consistent with uh, basically learning the physiology of rowing and putting the emphasis where it needed to be. We looked at world-class junior rowers. These were German rowers. I worked with a guy named Gulich from the uh, Dutch, uh, the German Olympic Federation. 95% of their training time, based on time in zone from heart rate, was at this extensive range. This is a two-time gold medal winner from Norway, two-time gold medal winner in the single in the Olympics, world champion a couple times, silver medalist in the double, mostly low intensity across the season. But some increase in high intensity definitely as the season progresses, and then you really only see the highest intensities during the competitive season. So you might ask the question, why so much so-called green zone training? And I'm going to suggest three mechanisms. One, at the top, I would say that it does matter. We do see across sports, Sorry. <laughs> we do see across sports that athletes invest a lot of time at low intensity. So in, it's not just intensity that matters, it's intensity times duration. Professional cyclists are doing five hour rides regularly. Runners are doing two hour long runs, two and a half hour long runs. Rowers will do two hour rows. So we have to always look at the intensity in the context of the duration when we, look, when we try to think about the signal that we're generating for adaptation. We also, some speculation has been made about whether this type of intensity distribution helps with energy availability management to avoid getting into a glycogen, glycogen depletion situation all the time. But I think maybe more importantly, by using intensity times duration at low intensity, we're able to avoid a big systemic stress response while still turning on these adaptations. Because one thing we do know that is a wonderful recipe for overtraining an athlete, that is just to have them train at medium hard threshold intensity day after day 
It's a perfect recipe for, for burnout and for overtrading, if that's what your goal is. All right, so here's the, the feedback trinity that we work with. Power is obviously something we can measure better than we've ever been able to. You can measure it indoors, but you can also measure it outdoors. You can measure it in the boat. Pace, if you're a runner. So we have, that's external load. That's the actual output. And we're going to learn a lot more about that tomorrow from, from Lotta. But if we move internally, then we have these physiological responses. The ones that are most available to us as coaches and scientists are heart rate and blood lactate. We can measure oxygen consumption. We can measure some other things. But the two big ones are heart rate and blood lactate. And those are very very easily achievable, although blood lactate probably does not get measured so much in the field. And then we have perception. We could ask people how they feel, either just qualitatively, but often nowadays we use some form of scale, like a Borg scale or a session RPE scale after the workout to ask people. And what we find is that athletes tend to be very well calibrated once they learn the scale. But you can't, a 12 for this athlete and a 12 for another athlete aren't necessarily the same. But within athlete, they, they, it can become quite uh, a valuable tool for understanding how they are perceiving the load. And it, so we're, we're able to look at this relationship. We're asking the athlete to do a certain amount of work or a certain intensity, a workload, and we're, we want to be able to monitor the cost. What's it costing this athlete? Not only over time, but during the workout. When should we shut it down? When should we say, today's enough, two hours is long enough? Because they're going to need to come back tomorrow and the next day. And so we need to be able to look at these, these variables in relationship to each other. If you just look at power, there's going to be problems for your athlete over time. So we have training zones. There are different systems. This is typical of the Norwegian. They use a five zone model within the aerobic range. And those zones are anchored around a couple of physiologically defensible, detectable so-called thresholds, either with ventilation or with lactate. On average, the first threshold is around two millimolar. On average, the Second turn point is around four millimolar, but it needs to be measured individually because it will vary. And then, of course, we, we measure VO2 max, we measure maximum heart rate. So these are lab, we can anchor a zone system with these because we can find them. We can measure it and, and quantify those anchor points on a scale. Now, we can make up some more stuff like that line between zone one and two, it's not physiology, but it may be practical. It may help in the pedagogy, the, the dialogue between coach and athlete to say, well, you know, from here to here, we're starting to get a little bit, I don't want you here too often because you'll easily slide into threshold. Maybe that helps, but it's not a physiological barrier or, or line. And the same here. This is, a, this is just a tool for communication. So it may be, and then of course we have anaerobic training, so I just call that blue sky because then heart rate doesn't matter. All right. But for a lot of purposes, if you're working with athletes, it may be that three zones is enough because these are the ones that are physiologically kind of defensible. You can identify it. And particularly with young athletes, I would just use three and, and help them to understand what green means how it should feel the the perception the rpe the blood lactate where should they be in those in those sessions in these sessions and then maybe add some detail later and if you don't have a lot of equipment and you don't have blood lactate and heart rate it turns out uh, that one fairly reasonable way to go is just to look at the, the old-fashioned talk test. At least during, it's a little bit different during rowing just because of the breathing situation, but basically 
if you're in that sub first threshold intensity, you should be able to actually talk in sentences while you're running, while you're cycling. Some have even said you should be able to just breathe through your nose. I'm not sure that's true, but that's another poor man's test for whether or not you're actually in this green zone on an extensive endurance day. Because the danger will be that they'll slide up here. All right. And the other thing you should see in your athletes, if they're well ventilated, is that once they've been rowing about 15 minutes, from 15 minutes to say an hour, you shouldn't really see a change in heart rate. It should stay flat if they're in that low intensity zone. If they're at threshold or above, you will see a drift upward in heart rate. It just, it won't flatten out. So that's a check. That's a, some feedback that you can look for to see, I told my athlete to go low today. Are they actually there? Now what we've seen, we, this is a study we published based on uh, elite orienteers training twice a day. We had them either run for one hour at low intensity, blood lactate 1.0, or two hours at low intensity, blood lactate 1.0, or we had them do a threshold workout, blood lactate about 3, 2.7 on average, or we had them do a, 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 an interval session, six times three minutes blood lactate about seven and so everything matched up and then we looked at heart rate variability recovery to look at autonomic stress and what we saw was is once they got above their threshold the recovery response was the same whether it was a threshold or high intensity intervals I think that's kind of interesting and it's kind of in, in keeping with what we see is that athletes elite performers are pretty careful to keep green days green, if you want to put it that way. Make sure that low intensity stays low because if we trigger that stress response and if, if these days become threshold days too often, then we put our athlete in a, or they put themselves in a bad situation where they're not going to recover over time. And looking at those hundreds of workouts, then we get in a, a negative uh, balance situation. So in some ways, I would say that based on what we've seen with the physiology, with the relationship between intensity and duration, it's almost like there's just really two intensity zones. But there's a, it's a, a sliding scale because during the workout, there's fatigue that's happening. And so in, whoops. So in a way, you've got this. We, if we're going to stay low, then we want to stay below this intensity. And as the athlete fatigues, it's as if this intensity goes down because heart rate drifts up, okay? So two hours into a low intensity row feels pretty different than 15 minutes. I think we can all remember that, right? So low intensity is low intensity, but if you do it long enough, it can still end up being pretty damn tough, stressful on the body. So. We have to know when to shut it down and when to say, no, for this athlete, a 90 minute long session is enough. That's what they tolerate. So here's an example. This is actually a 54 year old professor that's kind of trying to get back in shape. Who will remain nameless. <laughs> but on the up, upper side, you see 200 watts, uh, after 20 minutes, so after plenty of time to get the body warm and so forth, heart rate is 103. Maximum heart rate for cycling right now for this 54-year-old guy is about 165, so that's very manageable. And an hour and a half later, it's still the same. It's flat. Pretty proud of that. That's 200 watts. But same, same person at 240, pretty close to that threshold, probably a little over, now you see steady drift. So heart rate drift is a, a poor man's indicator that your athlete is not below the first threshold if their heart rate is just drifting up. But here's the caveat to this. When this professor did this workout, 
Got a big fan blowing straight on. Room, open the door. It's in Norway. It's always cold in Norway, so it's about 18 degrees C in the, in the room. So good ventilation, no sweat accumulating on the floor under because it's evaporating off the skin. So heat is being managed, heat production. And then you will see that flat heart rate response. But if you are in a typical clubhouse with a dozen 90 to 100 kilo rowers, breathing 100 liters of humid CO2 enriched air into the room every minute and you're not ventilating, you're not, you're not using industrial fans to keep them cool, then I assure you that their low intensity sessions will, will their heart rate will drift up the whole time. You have to take care. You gotta remember, rowers, male and female, they're the biggest endurance athletes on the planet. And they produce a lot of heat. And because their bodies are bigger, they're going to have trouble getting rid of it. That's physics. Okay? Surface area to volume ratios don't go in favor of being a big rower. So you have to take care of them in the winter. If you want them to row inside, you want them to do those long steady state workouts, bring in the fans open the windows, open the doors, and let them stay cool, okay? So that the blood flow goes to their legs and their back, not to their skin to cool them down. Otherwise, you're defeating a lot of the purpose of those, those workouts. This is true at Oxford, it's true at Cambridge, it's true all over, because they don't ventilate well enough. And a lot of them said, I've never seen a workout where my heart rate stayed flat. Well, there's a reason. So here's an example of what happens with some training. This is again that same professor that's trying to get back in shape. The December 18, the red line is after about four or five months of riding. So that's 200, 205 watts, percentage heart rate max. And you see for the first 90 minutes, heart rate just stays nice and flat. But then, still exactly the same conditions, same ventilation, drinking lots, everything. But suddenly heart rate starts going up. And I can also assure you, I happen to know from this subject, perceived exertion is going up. Legs aren't feeling so good as they did. It's not quite as fun as it was, even though power is the same. So there is a change that is happening between the external workload and the internal workload. They are not in steady state. This is what happens, even at low intensity. There's no such thing as a steady state. Eventually, things break down. But with time, you look at the green line, same athletes, six months later, same exact power. Now, mostly what you see is a little bit lower, but mostly it just is not drifting up as fast. Better durability. That's one of the things we're building into our athlete with those low intensity sessions. Okay? We're changing some physiology that's pretty hard to detect with a VO2 max test. In fact, it doesn't appear or a threshold test, but it's important because now they're tolerating more load, which makes it possible for them to work harder on the hard days, which we think is important for the six minute race down the road. So this all adds up. A few things just to keep in mind. Uh, you don't need to go into the lab multiple times in a season to figure out the, your lactate profile because one thing that's nice is once you know the heart rate at a given threshold, it turns out that heart rate is quite stable. So power, power hopefully goes up at that heart rate, but that the heart rate where the threshold, where that break happens stays pretty consistent. Okay, that's useful. We don't need to go into the lab four or five times a year. Once where you know we get a good profile can actually be enough, all right, if you're consistent with the way you measure things. So this we learned from several studies, including from Carl Foster, who I know has been here numerous times. Another thing is about heart rate. Now this is data from our lab where we've had about a hundred
I think there's 102 different cyclists where we've all, they've all done uh, max tests and we knew their age and we calc found their maximum heart rate during the test, but then we looked at what their actual maximum heart rate was versus what these different prediction formulas said. And then we looked at the deviations. So was it zero to three beats, four to seven beats, eight to 12, and so forth. And what you see is, yeah, you, you get it right sometimes, but for a lot of athletes, if you use these formulas, disaster. It can be up to 20 beats difference, which means you are going to totally miss the training zones that you're shooting for. So you need to know what maximum heart rate is if you're going to use it in training or use percent heart rate. This, the point here is to show you that I said two and four millimolar are typical break points, but it can happen a lot earlier and particularly with high performance athletes. This is actually uh, my daughter, so she's not that high performance, but their blood lactate actually gets lower and it may be 1.5 at that first threshold, 1.4. It may be 2.8 or three at the second threshold. So. If you're going to measure lactate, don't just assume two and four, because often that'll mean that your athlete's actually working harder than they should be. So this is the point of all of this. We're going to learn much more tomorrow, but you need feedback. Please don't rely on just one tool. Don't rely just on power or stroke rate because it will not tell you everything you need to know. It doesn't translate always to the internal workload. And that's after all what your athlete is experiencing those 500 times a year. So use all three, perception, the physiology that you can get your hand on, and the power or pace. Because ultimately, it's these two questions you want to answer. And there's not going to be a formula for it. All right. Thank you.